Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto was awakened with the power of Immortal God? Here is short summary I move. Immortal in a world of machinations and plots. Even though I am only a shadow of the person I used to be, I still come and leave. Why create such a fuss about something as insignificant as an uncomfortable chair, as the Iron Throne is? Generally, I opt to give other people little thought. However, when even the dead resurrect. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time. Let's begin the story. Death is the strongest power there is. We are all consumed and destroyed by death. I am not sure if time is an equal force, though it might be. Furthermore, I couldn't tell one from the other because they are so closely related. Death is not biased. Someone has to meet her eventually. Be a commoner, a prince heir, a blacksmith's son, or even a monarch. It will be your turn eventually. I would want to believe that there isn't a greater unchanging truth. That death is inevitable and irreversible. Nothing more, nothing truer, could be my desire. And I'd like to think that even I will have to confront death at some point. I would willingly set aside all of my ideas in order to firmly think that death is the most powerful force of all. However, regretfully, I am aware of the reality in the end. We always say that you must take life into account in order to understand death. Without the other, the first one cannot exist. I implore you. What do you do when not even the power of death can bring you to an end? When death's arms cannot hold back an even more powerful force? Does this imply that you cannot live if you are unable to die? Neither a demon nor a god asterisk Westeros, Calendar of the Seven Kingdoms, Year 282. The insurrection led by Robert Baratheon persisted, promising a short but brutal struggle. Among the seven families, some have already selected a side. Others remained in the middle, often siding with both sides while remaining hidden. One of them was the Lannister House, which is currently headed by the Hand of the King, Tywin Lannister. Undoubtedly, none of those families would do anything to avoid losing out on their share of the spoils at the end of the conflict. That, at least, was the rational explanation Cersei could come up with for her present state of imprisonment. She didn't think that the Men's Bandit Act, which, incidentally, was precisely where she was being held captive, was real. Within a dungeon. A cavern. In the end, she discovered that she didn't really care. She may even be in Essos, for all she knew, for that matter. One thing was for certain. The bandits who captured her weren't just any old second swords. Were they employed by the Mad King to put an end to his hand's uprising? Or to give the insurrection any advantage in the conflict? It's possible that she was unaware of a third party. She had no choice but to rely on her family to get her out of this situation. By the time she was 15, almost 16, she knew exactly how the world operated. More accurately, she could only hope that Jamie would show up to save her. And her father, too, though she didn't think it would come from a place of goodwill. She so waited in her cell's darkness while she was being held captive. It could have been far worse than what she was living, at least, she reasoned. As evidence of her captivity, the persons who seized her may have beaten, sexually assaulted, or slashed her leg or her fingers. She had gorgeous blonde hair, and not a single hair was damaged by them. They could have done anything else, but they simply decided to lock her in this cell. There were just two guards left to watch her. She made a few of attempts to talk to them and get some information, but all she got in return was a stare and silence. She would give the order to have them all quickly slain once she was saved, at least some kind of incentive for their actions. Gazing down at the captivating sky blue eyes, she rotated around on the floor she lay on. She was on the verge of screaming. With a slight smile on his face, the man seated on the floor of her cell caught her attention. How in the hell? She retreated from the man until she came into contact with the wall. Undoubtedly a fruitless response, but more of an impulse than anything else. How could this man have gotten into her cell and left her unseen? Though she wasn't really paying attention to her surroundings, she assumed she would have noticed his arrival. For the entire time, she had been staring at the one door. And before to that, she was positive that nobody had been in her cell. She corrected herself mentally, well, pretty sure. She glanced outside her cage to her guards, shaking. On their wooden chair, they appeared to be dozing off. Odd. She held her breath for a moment to gather herself before scrutinizing the stranger closely. His appearance alone was undoubtedly quite intriguing. The house Tully's blue eyes belonged to him. 
not without remembering a peculiar blending of Lannister and Targaryen, blonde hairs that was. A stark face and a body halfway between Aaron and Martell. Not to be overlooked are the three odd, seemingly scratched marks on each of his cheeks. He had on brown leather gloves and black furry boots, his huge dark green winter cloak, of a material she could not quite place, kept the rest of his body covered. It appeared to be a combination of fur, leaves, and maybe feathers from a bird. His expression suggested that he was perhaps four or five years her senior. This man, who was he? She spoke out loud, voicing her questions, who are you? He gave her a broad smile that allowed her to see his bright white teeth. Then, he had to be descended from an aristocratic family. You can call me little girl Naruto, but I felt it was polite to introduce yourself before this kind of presentation, don't you? With a critical gaze, she observed that if he was indeed with her abductors, he was undoubtedly already aware of her. I am Cersei Lannister, he laughed a little at the tone she was speaking in, supposing her to be a powerful princess. Ah, the name seems a little familiar? Have we previously had a meeting? She fixed her gaze on him, thinking he must be kidding. I am the daughter of Tywin Lannister, Hand of the King, Head of House Lannister, Lord of Castly Rock, Warden of the West, Lord Paramount of the Westerland and Protector of the Realm. Naruto gave her a quizzical look. Wow, a lot of titles for one dude. You know, even though I didn't ask for your father. With the name of some guy who's not even here, what can I do? With a stare that might have frozen the tundra, Cersei felt she may as well have grown a second head. Why have you come here? Hmm. Interesting query. Even I'm not really convinced. Meeting a lovely female would be my initial course of action. Perhaps the all powerful gods intended for me to come here. Perhaps I was only lost because I followed a black cat. Or perhaps I was unable to resist meeting the princess in need. When I was younger, that was always one of my fantasies. To ride my white horse to the princess's rescue, who is so gorgeous. Seems a little bit tragic, don't you? He laughed, and Cersei, for once in her life, could not contain her laughter, and she scowled as soon as she realized what in the name of the Seven was happening to her. The man standing in front of her was most likely one of her kidnappers, a little insane, but a kidnapper nonetheless. It was an unwritten, common sense based rule that you do not become friends with your captor unless it was a plot to escape his hold, but for a split second, her smile was gone. That man was who? What can I do to help you? Are you collaborating with my kidnappers? He fixed his gaze on her, allowing a little smile to briefly brighten his face before it vanished. I don't collaborate with anyone. The world will end on the day I receive an order from someone. He forced a smile at that specific thought. I am not with the guys who took you hostage. Little one, all I want to do is talk to you. She frowned miserably at the title for some reason she did not know, not because she liked the name, far from it, but generally she would not allow such little matters to get to the point where she would act out especially in front of a man she did not trust. He didn't appear to be carrying a weapon or armor, but his body was built like a warrior, displaying his well-developed muscles even beneath his baggy clothes, so she let go of her arms, realizing that he wasn't about to approach her. What topic would you like to discuss? At this point, I'm unsure. You might say that I was sort of led here, so for now, I simply want to know who I'm interacting with. What topic would you like to discuss? She said again. There was a pause, and Naruto's head tipped left, then right, for a few seconds before flashing a smile as his mind processed the query. My love, what is your dream? With a threatening look in his direction, she chose to completely ignore the question, as she was starting to have a pretty good sense of who she was dealing with. Are you a magician or wizard of some sort? I had previously met someone who identified as a witch. She gave the impression that she could see into the future. She hesitated a moment, a vile smirk warping her features. I ordered to have her killed after telling me my future. She was a little surprised that Naruto did not even flinch. Instead, he simply looked at her thoughtfully, as if he had somehow lost himself in another universe. He was happy to hear that Sheehan's power was not entirely lost after all, but it meant that magic had already resurfaced in the world. Was he too late? He had no idea that this specific magic had already been activated. How long had it been since the last time? 800 years or something like that, he wondered. Either way, was this the reason his avatar beyond the wall had drawn his attention to her, to demonstrate to him that magic had materialized already? Was there something else remarkable about this female, or was it just overacting and pointless? 
why not just bring him to a current magic user? A compelling narrative, he remarked simply, reflecting. Cersei continued to reason despite his stoic response. In fact, this shift in conduct was more evidence for her theory than anything else. So, dear wizard, what is your power then? Do you also have premonition? Or take to the skies? Take a breath underwater. He laughed in a way that was oddly aggravating to Cersei. Was he making fun of her? Once more, she recalled that normally, reactions like that would not even make her blink. MMH, no, nothing like that, he corrected himself mentally, well, not anymore, but he was definitely not going to tell her that. He reached into his coat to retrieve a small brown spherical, which Cersei examined more closely and determined to be a plant seed. Look, small one. As he brought his hand to meet hers, Naruto gave an instruction. With her eyes wide open, she watched as the plant seed quickly grew, and in less than a second, a magnificent white rose appeared in the man's hand. Naruto extended his hand to give her the flower, which she took carefully and gazed at in wonder, having never seen a flower like this in King's Landing Gardens. I can stimulate the energy within living beings, he stated. It comes from growing plants to heal animals and even people. He could even, at its peak, generate plants or trees, but for the time being he didn't really need to inform her about that. Mokaton and all things associated to chakras had long since been lost. The next question she posed to him was not precisely what he had anticipated, but it was also not entirely out of the blue. Is it possible to revive the dead? There was a delay. It took him ten seconds to respond. No, Cersei looked at him. She must have sensed his reluctance a little, but luckily she refrained from pressing him for more details. Clever child. He made the decision to respond more truthfully. Not in the manner you had hoped. I assure you that the outcome would not be attractive. She frowned as she did. It was not as if he had better things to do right now, so he decided to look into it a little bit more. He mentally validated his earlier assumption. Wise kid, indeed. Who have you lost? She was hesitant, naturally, but in the end she told him. After all, he had just revealed to her what she felt was an enormous secret, and she felt that a little openness would help her understand this strange individual a little better. As a child, she had come to understand the axiom that there is always a plot within the plot, and had learned how to control and manipulate people, emotions, and even herself. She didn't know why, but she felt as though some higher power was urging her to trust this man, and no matter how hard she tried to ignore it, it was just an excuse in this situation. My mom, Naruto did not reply right away, but instead calmly watched the tumult of emotions behind those green eyes. Though he did not realize it at first, the girl was undoubtedly a remarkable beauty in the making. Even though she was still young, he could already see the makings of a very beautiful person. He sighed, moving carefully so as not to startle her, and sat on the stone bed in the cell beside Cersei's still lying seated figure before placing a gentle palm on top of her head and grinning a little. Cersei did not back down this time, instead, she continued to closely observe his every action. I apologize for that, he eventually said. Have you also lost someone? She may also use that as leverage to build a relationship with him. She inquired, interested in the feelings that were swimming in his eyes. She had quickly ascertained that the man before her was a very bad liar. Moreover, he was unable to control his emotions, and his face was a veritable open book for her to read. This presented a golden opportunity for her to take advantage of, as she had grown up in a world of deceit, manipulation, secrecy, and conspiracy. This man was so unlike the others, he appeared to have no hidden agenda. He was like the kind father she had always imagined having as a youngster and the kind mother she had never met. She was fifteen, unfortunately for him, and although people might underestimate her due to her age, she used that as a chance to better use them. If needed, she would also use that man, who could get her out of this situation and use his power to help her gain the Iron Throne. He was probably about twenty years old, and if needed, she would gladly use her body to make him her puppet. The fact that she had never encountered a more attractive man was the cherry on top. She would smash everything that stood in her way, this man or anybody else. Her question was met with a sad smile from Naruto, who instantly dispelled the guilt that was mounting in her chest. Little one, I lost a lot of people. More than you could figure out. People that used to be close to me are no longer with me. Cersei felt a butterfly in her lungs, heat melting her cheeks, her determination melting like summertime snow but she pushed herself to push the feeling away as he looked aside, caressing her head softly. My parents passed away the day I was born, 
so I never knew them, he remarked. However, I knew they both cherished me deeply even though I had never met them. Cersei felt her heart skip a beat as he turned to face her, his sky-blue eyes meeting emerald ones. You are not required to grieve for your departed loved ones. They watch you closely at all times, in their own way. The only thing you can do for them is to live your life as though they were still here, keeping an eye on you, and to never forget their memory. Kind, loving, and all-encompassing. Cersei understood that no matter how hard she tried to defend herself, she was fighting a losing battle and she could never convince this man to be some kind of puppet in her game, he was too kind to be a part of any evil plan Cersei might be hatching. She particularly liked the powerful and fascinating nature of his voice and words, which she knew she needed to fulfill her dream. He could certainly persuade people in an instant if he so desired. In this instance, even she was falling for it, his voice, his charm, his soft authority, for her, this was unquestionably more alluring and scary than anything else. Worst of all, she felt almost relieved that she had. Nearly. He was much too innocent. But what about those who brought them about? Do you not want to see them dead? She said gently. Or would you prefer that they go unpunished for their crimes and walk free? He seemed to consider his response carefully and was silent for ten seconds. I'm not really sure. I guess it really depends on the individual. I was the one who always gave things another go. I would approach the offender and inquire about his motivations. Every time, I found that they weren't all that different from myself. True, I killed a few, but I always managed to grasp a portion of their decision. So, you allowed a few people who had harmed you to leave. She summarized, slightly offended, it's a coward and weak apology for the dead. She would never accept this way of thinking. Dead people are dead. Even if you take revenge on them, nothing will actually change for them. The only way to keep others from experiencing what you did was to take the lives of those who were eager to commit murder once more. She realized it was a lost battle there, and she wasn't even sure why she had tried to talk him out of it. She needed to come up with a plan to get him to help her leave. He asked another inquiry before she could bring up another subject. Someone murdered your mother. He made a demand. When giving birth to my younger brother, she passed away. A dwarf, she said matter-of-factly, seeing no need to express her disgust for the imp. She was getting weary of those arguments, since there was nothing she could possibly learn from him because he was so firm in his convictions. Naruto merely answered, I see. It's interesting that he's a dwarf. Perhaps he might visit him someday. Dwarves were known to frequently carry magic, whether it was apparent or not to the naked eye, for reasons he didn't fully understand. It was also a hereditary propensity that he belonged to one of the seven great families. I saw that you failed to respond to my query earlier. Which dream do you have? She did not cry it aloud, but the majority of her family already knew the answer, and she knew it instantly. It was not truly a secret. I wish to rule Westeros as queen. Possess the ability to conceive and bear children that I will always treasure and whom I can trust with my life. She did not understand the exhausted smile he flashed her. It made Naruto very sad to think about how this little girl saw the world. Did she need children in order to be able to trust someone at last? He lost a great deal of his old authority, but it should be within reach for him. The Game of Thrones was really concerning. Was it time to stop it? He got up and said, Well, I think that will be all for now. Cersei became agitated, getting to her feet and grabbing hold of his arm. Hold on. I can't be left in here by you. I have no idea where I am at all. She fired him a shot. With a bright smile on his face, Naruto reached into his coat and extracted another plant seed. Your brother is en route to this location right now. Sweetheart, don't worry too much. He'll arrive there in a few minutes. She studied him intently, trying to decide whether or not to believe what he was saying and allow hope to grow inside of her. When she saw nothing to indicate that he was lying, she released his arm from her hold. Then he grabbed the seed in his fingers, and just like the flower, it turned into a gorgeously shaped wood bracelet. Naruto felt her curious gaze, grinned, and handed it to her. Compared to the floral bracelet, this one has a little more special meaning. No matter how far I am, if you think of me while holding it, I will be aware of it. He took a little break. Use this and I will come if your life or the life of one of your most valuable individuals is in danger and there is no way for you to preserve it. I promise to at least attempt to help you, love, even though I cannot promise anything. Cersei's eyes widened as she realized what a sincere and wholehearted gesture this man had just made to her. She did not even mistrust him because he truly was one of a kind. 
Clatter filled the room as she reached out to thank him, or perhaps stop him, and then she turned to see her twin brother, Jamie Lannister, who had just killed the last of the two men who were guarding her, staring her in the face with a look of delight. Cersei whirled around to look for Naruto, who had been in her one door cell less than ten seconds before, but all she could find was nothing. Neither a demon nor a god asterisk Naruto strolled along the road towards the north. His objective for the time being was located far beyond the wall, where his avatar had taken up residence. It was time for a quick conversation with him. As he traveled, he cursed in his head for the lack of dragons in those troubled times. He estimated the number of centuries that had passed since he had not seen one. Even with their problems, dragons had once been his favorite means of long-distance travel. Now, he had to spend several months just to travel a short distance. It was really bothersome. The road he was on was not the main one. He was not a great fan of crowds, and this was especially true during these wartime years. He felt that an individual was smarter and more perceptive by himself than when he was in the company of others, he was then more likely to follow the public opinion and its judgment, which was frequently foolish. Team spirit. More like one spirit divided among the members of the team, Small groups of people were okay in his view, and he even welcomed other judgment. But crowds were just dumb and misled by two or three people. Like some flock led by ranchers to slaughter. Returning to the subject, he was lost in thought as he followed a narrow trail through the heart of the forest. It had to be some sort of farmer's route. All he could hear was the sound of the natural world. It was satisfying. It was never intended to last, of course. The calm was abruptly disturbed by a scream a woman's scream, to be more precise. He scowled. The cry came from a different direction than the one he was following, but he still made the decision to go have a look. He wasn't in a rush, so he veered off the road and crossed a portion of the forest, emerging after a few minutes to see a medium-sized house, possibly a tavern, he surmised. After the first scream, he heard none more, so he went to investigate inside and opened the door, hearing a few laughter. It was not a pretty sight that greeted him. His eyes became hard, but he did not even blink. A middle-aged woman lay lifeless on a table with her legs apart, and three young women, the youngest of whom was no older than twelve, were stuck to the wall, clearly dead and having been raped before being murdered. A fat man, who he surmised was probably the innkeeper, lay in a bloodbath on the floor. Two other young men were near him, their throats slashed. At last, Naruto looked up into the hall where eleven men in uniform and armor were laughing and chatting noisily. One of them had just completed buttoning his pants. The blonde had no idea who these men were, though he could surmise that they were likely rebels on one side or the other, but for the time being he could not really care. Why would he? In his opinion, those eleven guys had already passed on, they were simply unaware of it at the time. He pulled out a staff that was no longer than two feet long from under his big, dark green coat, it was flimsy and did not appear to be able to withstand even the slightest wind. With his left hand still concealed by the cloak, Naruto grabbed it with his right and moved cautiously toward the first man among the eleven who was standing. The eleven guys saw him many meters before he reached his first target, and when they saw the stick of wood in his hand and the shadowy expression covering his eyes, they nearly burst out laughing. Hey, young one. This was your opportunity lost. We've just completed the final one. Regretfully, Cherry Boy. His first target was the one who had spoken and from the corner of his eye, Naruto saw that his friends were all giggling loudly at his remark. As a result, none of them witnessed what took place. Without another look, Naruto sidestepped his initial target, and to everyone else in the room, their friend had vanished from sight, his body motionless and his face expressionless. His head felt from his shoulders without a sound, one defeated. By the time the ten men realized their colleague was dead, Naruto's hand had already stopped moving quickly enough to get close to the head of his second target, and a second head had silently joined the first one that had fallen to the ground. The tavern rang with the sound of swords being drawn, but already the head of a third man felt heavy. Another sensed before he could even lift his blade, and Naruto moved like a death ripper, his eyes dead and his face blank. There are still seven to go. The seven men who were still alive decided to huddle in a corner of the hall. Seeing the carnage unfold before their horrified eyes, Naruto strode right up to them, his breathing controlled and his strides calm. Just one hand was sufficient to control the strength from the two grown men, and Naruto's stick did not tremble as two guys with enough courage moved forward, their blade raised in the air heading straight for his head. 
he produced another stick from under his cloak, piercing the man on his right's heart in the process, and then, as the pressure on the stick he was using to hold both swords away decreased, he tilted it sideways. The man lost his balance when the last blade slipped on the staff, and Naruto instantly chopped off his head with his left stick. Five more to go after these six. The five surviving soldiers saw the blonde as an immovable force, with two sticks, deadly moves, and without a backward glance, he dispatched six men clad in full armor with blades, seemingly without exerting any effort at all. It was as if he were strolling placidly in their direction, and the road to blood was merely an afterthought. Four men darted toward him, two of them attacking, the other two hoping to take advantage of the commotion and get by him and out the other way. The final man, number five, retreated till his back struck the wall. Naruto just assumed that he was smarter than the rest. With one sword coming from above and the other slicing the air from his left side, Naruto sidestepped the first one and leapt over the second, carefully eyeing the two men attempting to sidestep him while in the air, completing one full revolution on himself and carving the two flying men in the process. They dropped their heads silently. Then Naruto let gravity pull him back down to the earth smashing both of the attacking men's swords under his feet in the process. He saw to it that one soldier's heart was immediately pierced by each of his sticks, and the two of them hurried to join their fallen companions on the ground. One more to go. Ten down. Naruto went up to the last soldier within the hall. He was weeping, with his weapon down, and pleading for his life on his knees. In that one glance, the blonde immortal severed his head from his body. Completely gone. With a sigh, Naruto looked around his living room, which was clearly once a happy place but was now a bloody disaster. He made the decision to bury every dead without making another noise. He could comprehend murder. He would be a hypocrite if he did not. He was possibly the most murderous person in history, past, present, and definitely future. Rape and torture for amusement were not among the many things he could tolerate. He would never, however, torture even the most evil man on earth for amusement. He would torture him for information or to prove a point, yes, but never for amusement, not out of pity for the man, at least not out of pity for himself. But he was not willing to tolerate the enjoyment of others' suffering and to take advantage of their weakness. He found solace in the knowledge that he was not a complete monster. Not quite yet. Asterisk neither a demon nor a god asterisk with an eyebrow lifted, Naruto cast a glance at the direwolf. After crossing the wall, he was spending his first night in the middle of the woods, and he had brought a large bundle of food with him. He knew how hard it was to find food in those snow-covered lands, and while it wouldn't kill him to go without food, he preferred to have a full stomach, so he built a fire and grilled some meat. He could have used his mokaton to build a whole house, but he didn't want to be discovered by just anyone. A mature gray direwolf emerged from the forest just as he was about to take his meal from the fire and begin eating it. He was now motionless, his hand clasping a piece of meat that was hanging right in front of his gaping mouth, a piece of meat that the newcomers seemed to find particularly intriguing. The dire wolf, strangely enough, did not seem to want to move, she was merely staring at him without showing any signs of distress. Naruto had to admit, he recently made an odd new friend. Naruto opened his mouth slowly, then held out the meal, eyeing the dire wolf once, then the meat, then the dire wolf again, moving the meat to the left the dire wolf's eyes following it, then moving it to the right, the predator's eyes following it still. With a sigh, Naruto tossed the piece of meat to the dire wolf, who quickly ate it with a shift, reaching for it as it was still in midair. Huh, impressive, he remarked sardonically. He groaned again, grabbed another pack of meat from beneath his cloak, gazed at the dire wolf, who returned his placid stare, and took another piece of meat wrapped in paper. He took out the container and tossed it into the fire then eyed at the two pieces of meat in his hands, then the dire wolf. Do you like it cooked or raw? With an arched eyebrow, he demanded. The animal glanced at him, the meat piece, and the fire, then back at him. Naruto nodded and placed both pieces on the fire. Whoa! You're very tasty, aren't you? I have never encountered a dire wolf who enjoys prepared flesh. I guess that eventually it was going to happen. After a few minutes, Naruto took the meat out of the fire and tossed a piece to the female direwolf, who promptly ate it like a snack before turning her head to look at the piece of meat he still had in his hand. The direwolf approached and stretched out on the other side of the fire in front of him as he patiently waited and turned the meat. The blonde quivered. Oh no. I own this one. I'm a young man in his youth's springtime. At least I deserve some meat. 
A vein appeared on Naruto's forehead, and the direwolf appeared to raise an eyebrow that didn't exist. Naturally, I am a young man in my youth. Do you not notice my attractive face and flawless physique? Though the direwolf remained motionless, Naruto could assure him that she had rolled her eyes. He growled darkly, TCH, cheeky brat. No respect for their elders I see. The dire wolf peered warily at Naruto as he bit his prey. The animal never looked away from him while she ate. She looked at him until he was almost gone, and then she stopped caring about the blonde. She straightened her posture and closed her eyes. Unceasingly, Naruto would mutter under his breath about disrespectful puppies who think of already being grown up and should learn to show some proper respect throughout. Neither a demon nor a god asterisk Naruto questioned, what about Snow White? As he traversed some snow-covered, abandoned areas. His response was a growl. He was now deep in the north, far away from all places that were covered with anything but rocks and snow. The female direwolf he had met on his first day had continued to follow him for the past two months since he had crossed the wall. He had no trouble with it. He could cultivate trees and so always have fruits and vegetables. It wasn't like he had to eat in the first place. He was sleeping like a baby every night in a house made of wood that he would destroy the next day, and he was handling the cold fairly well. He thought he was far enough away from the human land beyond the wall to go unnoticed. He has already lost himself once or twice, but it was only because he chose to take an adventurous approach to his travels. In short, he was relying only on the stars to propel him forward. As an aside, he soon discovered that astrology was not particularly useful in a place where the sky was constantly overcast. The dire wolf also appeared healthy. She might occasionally evade his view for a day or two, but she would always return carrying a deer, a rabbit, or some other sustenance. It seems that even if fruits and vegetables weren't her favorite food, she could still consume them. Naruto thought that the only issue they had still to deal with was coming up with a moniker for the female dire wolf. He came up with a good deal something that appeared to annoy the arrogant animal for a motive that was well beyond his comprehension. Did he cause her dislike for, cheeky brat, rocks buster, or, emo wolf? Well, like it or not, but we need to find you a name. I can't call you, dire wolf, or, you, all the time you know. The growl apparently meaning something like, not until you discover a proper name for my royal majesty, was ignored by Naruto. He soon discovered that she was quite the arrogant one, as he had met her right before the end of her growth. It wasn't as though he was unaware of the type, though. Even though she lacked a strong sense of humor, looking back, she was really fun to be around. God, she never laughed at his jokes. Still, they were decent ones. Naruto turned to face the road they were traveling on. He sensed that they were near. He imagined it was only beyond that cliff. Or even the subsequent one. There's no finer adventure than one whose end you don't know, unless it was the one they skipped three days ago. He smiled broadly when they reached the summit of their climb. Even the direwolf could not contain his amazement when he was by his side. The largest weirwood tree ever found atop a mountain stood before them. Its red leaves were gleaming brightly since the sun's ray was concentrated only there. Time and the weather had no effect on its white wood. Naruto knew there was a huge cave filled with roots at the base of the tree. The cave had been excavated into the mountain. Aha! I told you it was here, and you, you were like, Naruto, we are so lost, or, you have no idea where we are, right? But I knew it was right here since the beginning. The female direwolf turned her back on him and started to move in the direction of the weirwood tree. Naruto jerked and followed her in her tract, not saying anything. They arrived in front of the cave after safely navigating a level stretch of terrain. At first, the direwolf appeared unsure, but Naruto stepped in without any hesitation. When she noticed Naruto wink at her in jest, she finally got comfortable enough to follow. She was not afraid at all. Yes, cautious. I'm afraid not at all. They entered what appeared to be a maze made of rocks and roots after going through the entryway. Without pausing, Naruto moved forward, with the direwolf trailing closely after him. They continued in this manner for around five minutes before eventually stopping in a larger room. Naruto's face lit up with a tiny smile as he gazed at the pile of roots in front of him. The dire wolf stiffened, perceiving something other than her bothersome companion and herself in this dim space. However, despite her best efforts, she was unable to identify it. Abruptly the roots turned, exposing the form of an elderly man who appeared to be rooted there. He looked as aged as they come. He had a cane lying in his hand and was wearing a brown paw. 
Naruto stepped up calmly to take a seat next to the elderly guy on a route. Hold on. Needed he really label him an old man with an ancient appearance, since he was far older than this little old man? Naruto asked, teasingly, Hello Raven. How are you? Still busy taking root, nay? Please, stop it dad. It's still not funny, he sighed loudly as he paused. He gave Naruto a quick glance before focusing on the direwolf that was with him. I see you have met some pleasant company. What is your name, young one? The animal gave him a cautious but clearly curious look. A growl escaped her after ten seconds. Raven laughed. I see. You don't have a name, nay. So, what about I give you one? For instance, what do you think about, Stormflake? The dire wolf appeared to broaden her eyes a little before giving the name some thought. Then, seeming pretty pleased, she gave him another snarl. Softly grinning, Raven said, Stormflake it is. Naruto appeared to be dejected as he watched the tragedy unfold. Entering a corner, he drew an imaginary circle in the earth while invoking the complete immaturity of existence. The elderly man with an aged appearance reprimanded, Dad, please. Stop your mourning. We have more important matters to discuss. Naruto let out a sigh and stood up straight. He had penetrating sky blue eyes, but there was no sign of wickedness. For all the two months she had been taking care of the blonde man, the now named Stormflakes had not once noticed them being so serious and focused. Seven Kingdoms Calendar, 286 AD Westeros, The Landing of King. The Illness. A fatal yet widespread illness that struck farmers and nobility alike. In Westeros, it was responsible for about 10,000 fatalities annually. Additionally, it murdered the heir prince, the son of Queen Cersei and King Robert Baratheon, a week ago. For a few days, the king neglected all of his responsibilities and continued to drink in an attempt to forget or dull the agony. He crumbled multiple times, turning down consolation even from his closest friends. His own wife, Cersei, was no different. It's not like the queen gave a damn about her spouse. Her firstborn child, who was just two years old, passed away recently. For the previous week, she kept herself confined to her room. Her twin brother Jamie Lannister, who had recently passed away, was the only person she had contact with. She was really appreciative of his kindness. Her other child, her second son Joffrey Baratheon, who was just a few months old, was another person she watched closely. She was aware that Joffrey was not her husband Robert Baratheon's son. He was the source of her twin brother and her incestuous relationship. He was not entitled to the throne. All the same, she was going to give him her whole attention. She did, after all, swear to make him the legitimate heir. Nor did she wish to experience another loss of that nature. But she loved him dearly, even if her recently deceased son was the offspring of a man for whom she harbored nothing but contempt. She adored Joffrey, maybe even more. He was her first, after all. Suddenly, a hand was on her shoulder. Startled, she looked up at the stranger with her emerald eyes. She felt herself about to cry when she saw those sky blue eyes and a face that had not changed in a day since she had first seen him. He brought back memories of a time when her son was still living. She wasn't even enraged by his tardiness or the violated pledge. I apologize for your loss, Naruto only mumbled. She did not know what prompted her to move, but she jumped into his arms and gave him a bear hug. Without flinching, Naruto simply allowed her to weep on his chest. He brought her to her bed after a minute. Sitting together on the big royal mattress, Cersei grabbed her breath. Even though her eyes were still very red, she stopped crying. She pulled herself from Naruto's arms and fixed her aimless gaze on the air. She said, rather simply, you are late. There was no emotion in her voice. I know. I was very far from King's Landing when I sensed your call. I immediately left, but the time it took me to come here was too much. It's not a very good apology, but I want you to know that I am sincerely sorry. Naruto let out a sigh. Sensing the call, he just moved backwards against the wall, leaving Stormflake behind for the time being. It seems that the direwolf had made contact with a male member of her species. He did not want to come here and part them. She had the ability to slow him down. Ever since he got the call from Cersei, he hasn't had a break. Since learning about the Air Prince condition, he had been running non-stop for almost two weeks without eating, drinking, or sleeping. He was mentally exhausted, but he knew he would survive. But was a child's existence really any different from an immortal's little exhaustion? Remain here, beside me, Cersei pleaded feebly. If you stay in King's Landing, this will never happen again. She was obviously devastated. 
Her anguish was phony, yet her tears could not be more real. But even under those conditions, she could exploit the circumstance. In the future, Naruto might be able to heal her kids and serve as a springboard for greater authority and status. Even she was gradually becoming attracted to him in a self serving sense. There would be no opportunity for the others. She had crossed him three more times since they had initially met four years prior. Those were all the occasions when he spent a few days in King's Landing serving as a healer before vanishing. Regardless of the severity of the injuries, she had heard that he never lost a patient. Every time, he would see her and have brief conversations, nothing too serious. He was, however, gradually but definitely gaining a place in her heart despite their infrequent visits. She was at least conscious of her feelings, even though they were never truly related. She tried to force him to stay here every time, she failed every time, with the same justification each time. I am sorry little one, but I have some important business ongoing in the north. Something that could be a real threat to all Westeros, perhaps even beyond the sea. You always say that, but never really talk about it. What's in the north so important for you not staying here? His subtle, endearing smile warmed her heart. She realized right away that she would not be able to get him to remain this time. Sorry sweetheart, but it's better for you if you don't know about it. I hope that you or your children will never have to worry about that particular business. She scowled at the response, but she took it as given. She soon saw that Naruto was a complicated individual with many obligations, both to himself and to others. After a while, Naruto got up. Cersei saw him stir and snatched him up with a crushing hug from behind. Please stay with me for the night. Don't leave tonight, she whispered rubbing her well-defined chest up against his back. Naruto could feel the heat rising from his cheeks. He sighed and turned around, forcing his body to resist his inclination. Cersei. You are a married woman. Please, don't do something that you might regret later. The queen's thoughts were currently far from being devoted to her husband. Still, she answered. I don't love my husband Naruto. I married him only for politics and prestige, like most of nobles, but I love you. An embarrassment that made her heart race, she stomped it instantaneously. She stuck herself on his own and took advantage of his open mouth without giving him a chance to consider. She licked her lips, relishing the sensation that was building inside her chest. She put her hand on the back of his head while acting so he would have no escape. Naruto was first at a loss for words, he was no amateur in the field. In a twenty year old body, he had more than a few lifetimes of practice under his belt. He hadn't been in a romantic relationship for about twenty years, but it was nothing in comparison to the length of his life. He did not really take the time for such a thing, more so because of the North Dilemma. Although he had never encountered a married queen previously, he assumed that there was always a first time. Although he acknowledged that he had a slight crush on Cersei, he still saw her as a young child. She was just nineteen years old. He was not very fair about the situation, he had to admit. Everyone was just a child in his eyes. Yet, there was some memory of her childhood and subsequent adult relationships with those people. Even so, it took him five seconds to answer appropriately. Cersei let out a moan in response to Naruto's action. What a reply that was, too. If he could not persuade a woman with words alone, no doubt she couldn't run away from his clutches. It was barely a and immediately she felt her chest hammering fiercely with excitation. Naruto then lowered his hands on her back till they were on her bottom. He lifted her and carried her in bed without breaking the. He slipped off his dark green winter cloak. Not wanting him to have the upper hand, Cersei slipped removed her top and bra before placing his face on her. He massaged them delicately at first before increasing the rate. He then moved his right hand, entering her half removed dress and panties. He rubbed her entrance a couple of minutes before entering one, then two fingers. Cersei could not retain several quiet moans at this point from escaping her and she sensed herself becoming wetter and wetter. She hardened her grip on Naruto's hair and moved her hips up and down to further the pleasure she was feeling. He must have been with plenty of women to learn to procure women such pleasure, she guessed. It was tremendous. A hint of jealousy stung her heart at the assumption, but she squashed it immediately. She was in no position to give him some lecture. Ah, ah, ah Naruto. Ah. When she felt herself on the verge of finally coming, Naruto suddenly stopped. She stared wide eyes and mouth agape at him before anger raised in her when she saw the smile on his. She was going to kill him, slowly and painfully. Before she could speak, Naruto ended taking off her dress and her wet panties. He removed his top which left him bare-chested. 
Circe had to hold on a drool from escaping her mouth at the perfect sight. He then moved to kneel between her legs. When Circe finally understood his purpose, his mouth was already on her lower, licking wildly. The queen bit her to retain her wine. She grabbed the top of his head and pushed him further into her entrance while her legs got tangled beside his neck and back. He was literally crushed on her lower. Not that he seemed to care as he kept licking with greed between her legs. Ah, ah, Naru ah. This, time, when Circe felt like coming, she did not hesitate to trample Naruto on her entrance. He deprived her of pleasure once, not twice. She crushed him for nearly twenty seconds after her orgasm before finally letting him go. Naruto was not in any kind of hurry, consciously liking her entrance and his fingers of any fluids. She felt multiple shivers on all of her body at the action. Thank you for the meal, Naruto said teasingly, still in his fingers. He then moved and ed her tenderly on the. It was not a deep, but it was enough to make Cersei know about his feelings. Even Jamie and certainly not her husband could convey such pure emotion. She felt protected and cared at the same time, something that she thought would never happen again after her mother's death. She loved her children, but she was the one giving emotion, not the one receiving. Consequently, it made the queen remember why he was here in the first place. The memory of her dead son brought back tears in her eyes. Still, she embraced slowly Naruto who petted her on the back. He knew the feeling of having his child die in front of him, he could only be here for her and sympathized. Between her sobs, Cersei remembered why she had made her move on Naruto in the first place. She craved for making him stay here, at her side. She wanted to have him strengthen her position as queen and protect her children. So, for the sake of her plan, she forced back her tears and went to slip her hand under his pants. She had not anticipated a hand to catch hers before she could reach her goal. She turned her head, surprised, to see a tiny smile on Naruto's and such pure emotion in those sky blue eyes. Don't force yourself, sweetheart. I was glad to make you feel better and forget a bit of the pain you were enduring. We don't need to go any further tonight. You are exhausted and gloomy. I don't want to do it like this. She stared at him, gobsmacked. He was, there was no word for her to express. On the one hand, she felt depressed. He refused her advances and she did not succeed in adding him in her schemes this time again. On the other hand, her heart was racing like crazy. She never had and never expected to have someone she felt she could trust that much, no one except her children. She did not love him, not yet, but it was close. Dangerously close. Was she ready to trust someone? She barely knew anything about him. She was falling in her own trap. After ten seconds, she finally looked away and nodded. Sleep with me, she muttered. Not in an UAL sense I mean. Just, stay with me tonight. This time, she was not sure why she asked because of her plot, or because of something else. Naruto smiled and approached her. She was still in him bare-chested, but he did not really care. He lied down next to her and engulfed her in his embrace from behind, his chest pressed against her back. Cersei clung onto his arm and let a smile graced her face. She quickly fell asleep in the warm embrace. Neither a demon nor a god asterisk calendar of the Seven Kingdoms, year 287. Far beyond the wall, Weirwood Cave. Have you heard about the king beyond the wall? Raven asked. Naruto shrugged shoulder while eating an apple. He made grew an apple tree in the cave some time ago. And some others too, like an orange tree. Orange was awesome after all. He did well by keeping the Mokaton when he lost every other power. Near him, Stormflakes was silently watching both humans with cautious eyes. Can't say I have. Who is this new guy? He was a crow in the night's watch. He is now among the people he was tasked to kill. He is aware of the White Walker's threat and is trying to gather all tribes under one banner. It's been around five or six years since he began his crusade, Raven informed matter of factly. MMH, he is going to have some problem then, Naruto commented. Lots of the humans' tribes are in war with each other and would rather die than ally themselves, even with the White Walkers around. And let's not talk about the giants, those big stubborn weirdos, Naruto said in a rather annoyed voice. He did not dislike giants. He even thought they were pretty fun. Sadly, the giants did not share his enthusiasm. He just succeeded in having the giants join him, the man in the tree said with a small smile, eager to see the wood user reaction. Raven found a slight pleasure in seeing the blonde choke on his apple. Naruto beat his stomach before staring at his avatar, wide eyes. He was to say the least astonished. 
wh what raven smiled teasingly before speaking again a lot of tribes have not joined him yet but more and more of them are considering it i have some wargs in their group to keep an eye on them and see how the situation is evolving raven notified after his surprise naruto plunged deep in thought the king beyond the wall huh must be someone particularly convincing and strong-minded to make such a thing come true he was not expecting someone other than himself to act and gather the tribes like that do you want to help him he will likely become a considerable ally in the future don't you think raven demanded curious naruto let out a sigh he scratched his brain in thought before making his decision not yet if we act too soon with the tribes they will think that the white walkers are not a threat important enough to join the other tribes they will stay secluded and we will lose them all we need to act carefully with the white walkers or they will erase us all it is sad to say but we need to wait for the white walkers to do some damage before moving if we do not nobody will take us seriously enough before it's too late raven nodded understanding perfectly the logic of his father i will just keep an eye on them then i will allow more wargs to appear if needed to help them some among the tribes are strongly predisposed to this task raven said to an approving naruto the old man then sighed tiredly his eyes went drained do you think we have a chance against the white walkers i mean even if you succeed in retrieving and creating enough weapons to eliminate them we are still in clear disadvantage compared to your battle several hundred years ago we have no dragons at our side tension is palpable in the south and if a war happened it will be extremely difficult to resist the white walkers invasion and i will come to the end of my life soon you will have to find a new avatar and he will need to learn during the war or die raven was depressed naruto could easily see it and the blonde knew that it was not without reason it's true the lack of dragons when we had hundreds of them the last time is a major drawback but we will find some new assets this king beyond the wall is certainly one of them naruto sighed before allowing a slight smile to grace his and don't speak about you dying so soon kiddo you were in the springtime of your youth and have still plenty years to go believe it raven stretched into a genuine smile all right dad neither a demon nor a god asterisk calendar of the seven kingdoms year 290 westeros the landing of king it's a girl said the midwife a high-pitched cry escaped the of the scrap of a woman in the room stood five people well five and a half now cersei was in bed exhausted and covered in blood but elated nonetheless as jamie who was standing next to her she was eyeing the tiny little baby in the arms of the midwife another maid was in the room and was cleaning her body but cersei paid her no mind then there was so much blood it's disgusting joffrey commented from a corner in the room cersei had tried to make him come and grate her baby sister but he disagreed at four years old the heir prince was wondering why his presence was even needed here show her to me cersei commanded toward the midwife i want to see the face of my baby the servant did as said cersei stared with care and love toward the little thing she was her first daughter her eyes were still closed so she could not be sure but those blonde hairs of hers suggested that she was hers and jamie's daughter she was pleased it was the case she would have loved her baby the same if she was roberts but she would gladly take such pleasure away from the king the fact he did not even know about her cheating on him was irrelevant quite obviously jamie reached the same conclusion and allowed a slight smile on his face even if the girl would not know about him he was thankful to have another child after joffrey the boy was turning quite obsessive in the last months he just hoped that this little girl would not follow the same path then she opened her eyes her beautiful teary sky blue eyes it was as if an ice cold shower had felt onto the both of them none of the two expressed it in the outside world though for jamie it was a cruel disappointment she had blue eyes the sign of the house baratheon she was robert's child not his own he wanted to crush something for this cruel comeback in reality it was not as if he believed that cersei never had any ual relationship with her husband but he wanted at least to not be reminded of it in such a way she was becoming rather distant toward him lately was it the cause was her relationship with her husband better than what he expected sadly he could do nothing about it for cersei the matter was completely different the blue eyes were not dark blue as the ones from the house baratheon but sky blue she knew immediately who the father of this baby was naruto visited her around nine months ago the dates tallied with accuracy but consequences were not pleasant 
Jamie would think that this child was from Robert. Robert would without a doubt announce himself as the father. There was no problem from that side. The problem would come from Naruto himself. Despite his naive attitude, he was perhaps one of the most insightful people she knew. And he was wholehearted. If he came to learn about him having a daughter, no doubt he would want to be here and take care of her. Normally, she would be euphoric to have him next to her. She appreciated his presence more than she would like to admit it and the blonde was her plot in process from a long time already. Even if she knew he had feelings for her, it was still not enough to have him stay. But with a daughter, it would change everything. Naruto was a caring person. He would want to live at his daughter's side. However, here was the cruel catch. She could not have him stay with his daughter. How would people respond if a stranger with the same matching sky blue eyes was alarmingly close with her daughter? No doubt that Naruto would be a great father and a great ally in King's Landing. But if the truth about her cheating was exposed to the world, she and Naruto would be beheaded and her children disinherited. The same thing was true with Jamie, but he was her twin brother. It was not strange for people to see them so close. As long as they were not caught in the act of, there would be no problem. It was not the same with Naruto, she had to hide her daughter from him. She let out a tear at the prospect. Probably a tear of joy, the midwife thought while approaching the little baby girl to her mother. What would you like to call her? Cersei delicately took her daughter from the midwife grip. Marcella, she said, smiling despite her somber thoughts. Unknown to them, while in the middle of the night, all the flowers suddenly blossomed in King's Landing Gardens. Neither a demon nor a god asterisk calendar of the Seven Kingdoms year 291. People were watching them advancing with extreme awareness. Children who were previously playing across the campsite in the snow stopped to eye and awe at the full-size direwolf. Grown men and women alike were also staring at the animal, but their focuses were more on the package on Stormflake's back. Naruto did not blame them for the evil stares he received. At his side, the direwolf was tensed but she kept going nonetheless. She was not used to crowd of people. A. He supposed he shared the pain on this case. The time had come for him to make himself known from the people beyond the wall and especially their self-proclaimed king. He did not believe Raven when he told him that a man managed to gather nearly all of the remaining tribes under one banner. He supposed he owned the man an apology then. Most of the tribes were drawn together in this campsite in north of the wall. The free folk, huh? He had to say, he was impressed. Walking across the roads in the base camp, he easily spotted the men who were following him step by step. They were not particularly discreet he had to admit. They wished for him to know that he was tracked. Stormflakes growled when she noticed. Always the one to be in the limelight this one. He kept walking. Okay. How long before someone finally come and lead him to some place? It had been ten minutes already since he entered the camp and he did not even encounter the welcoming committee. He was growing tired of walking for Nothi. He stopped. Storm Flakes did the same. Five people were standing at rest ten meters in front of him. A giant, a bald one with scars all along his face, a dark-haired woman, a redhead man and, the king he guessed. Raven told him about his appearance and this man seemed to match the description. The old man in the tree did not say anything about a gloomy face though, but all others' features were here. The king advanced and his lieutenant followed. They stopped just in front of Naruto. What prevent us to kill you here and now for bringing a white walker inside this camp, boy? The bald one requested. The white walker tied on the back of Stormflakes seemed to hear his title because he began to move and make some sound. Well, as best as he could do at least. It was not easy for him without legs, arms and chin. I brought a gift with me for all of you, Baldi, Naruto informed dryly. A. Respect was two way around. Apparently, his interlocutor did not share the same idea as proved by the grimace on his face. The slicing sword in the air was a good hint too. Naruto simply stopped the blade by taking out a thin stick of wood from under his cloak. Way to go to great someone who came to help you face the white walkers, the blonde ironically commented. He then turned his sky blue eyes to the man he looked up for his success in gathering those tribes. You are Mance Raider, the one they call the king beyond the wall, right? The man eyed at him carefully. He kept well hidden in his mind the shock he felt after seeing the blonde stop a sword with one simple stick. Finally, he nodded. I am. Who are you? Why would you help us in our fights against the White Walkers? You can call me Naruto. And for starters, I will be blunt. 
I was truly impressed by the one who succeed in gathering all those hot-blooded guys together. I did not expect for one man alone to be able to accomplish such a feat. I have to thank you for that, Naruto expressed with gratitude in his eyes. I came to help because like you, I am human, well, he was not going to debate on that. Can an immortal with superpowers still be considered as human in their eyes? For now, let's just state that we share a common enemy. I want to eradicate the White Walkers probably even more than you do. It's why I came to offer you and your people a way to stand up against them. He made a sign with his hand for Stormflakes to approach. He then undid the bond on her back. The White Walker felt on the ground and started moving as best as it could. Without legs or arms, it was not particularly graceful. Naruto then took a black knife in his hand that seemed to be made in glass, it was not even sharp. This is dragon glass, Naruto said to the five persons and all the people who were around. Behold. He knelt and plunged the knife into the flesh of the white walker. The crawling dead man immediately shattered like glass and snow. It was rather a pretty sight. All the ones around him were looking wide eyes at the place where the white walker just disappeared. Can we talk in private now? Naruto demanded to the three men, one female and one giant. The king could just nod, his entire mind focused on what just happened. The king beyond the wall led him to a huge tent inside the camp, his four lieutenants and stormflakes following close behind. On the entire way, people were looking at them with surprise, hope and trepidation. The rumor of his achievement was spreading like wildfire. Mance Raider pushed back the entrance to allow him and his four men inside. Naruto took a glance around and was invited at the center of the tent. Silence was not kept long as the redhead man immediately began speaking. So, what's the deal boy? He asked. No deal, just facts, Naruto simply answered. I happen to possess huge supply of dragonglass. As you saw, white walkers split when they are hit by weapons made in that matter. I will give you what I have to stand up against them. Well, he was lying a bit about that. He was going to give them enough supply to arm nearly all of them with dragonglass. He had to keep some for his plan in the near future. And you want nothing for it, or do you expect for us to kill all of the White Walkers? The dark-haired woman asked. She sounded a bit aggressive, but mostly concerned for her people. Naruto let out a sigh. Let's face it. You will never succeed in killing them all. There are hundreds of millions of them in the far north, and their army never stops growing. The dragonglass is just for you to delay the inevitable. They are all the dead from the last eight centuries, and that's a lot. He was met with grave faces. Apparently, they did not know of that, huh? They were not about to contradict him though. They had to have an idea about the number beforehand then, but it was just speculation. I need time, and I will use you to buy me some. I will just give you the supply in dragonglass I have and you will do whatever you want with it. It is of no use against living beings, so you can't use it to attack the wall by the way. They all stared at him severely except for Mance. Stormflakes growled dangerously when she saw that but did not move, she seemed to be a bit aware of the giant. You sound like someone from the other side of the wall, boy, the bald man spoke with hatred in his eyes. I am, Naruto confirmed without hesitation, which destabilized a little all people present, but I am also from this side of the wall. Let's just say that I do not really care from which side you come. I lived in both and except for some habits and customs, it's nothing special. I care for people on this side and on the other side of the wall. You can call me a supporter of the living beings if you like. Quiet. The five people were staring at him like some kind of unknown that they could not understand. He probably was in their eyes. In those hard times, which side of the wall you were born into mattered a lot. Each community hated each other with fierce belief. In consequence, it was extremely strange to meet someone who did not share the same point of view. It was the king beyond the wall who finally broke the silence. So, if we do as you say, how do we proceed? Naruto smiled at him. The man cared for his people and was calm-minded and straight-talking. No doubt he was the one who succeeded in gathering the tribes. He could really become a powerful ally in the coming war. It's simple. I will conduct some of your men to the place where I have stored the dragonglass. You will take it then leave to do whatever you want. I have business to take care of on the other side of the wall so I will not help you more than that. He paused to take a breath. He hesitated before deciding to reveal them more of his plots. He would put his trust in this king. My goal is to ally the Seven Kingdom under a strong leader and make them aware of the threat of the White Walkers. However, I need time to do so. 
In the best scenario, I will convince them to open the wall for you to pass and we will then fight the White Walkers altogether. Mance Raider eyed at him carefully but did not find any clue indicating he was lying, he sighed. Okay, we will take the Dragonglass and then, we will move according to the situation. We won't attack the wall for now. But if the situation worsened, we won't hesitate to do so. The king then paused for a moment. Thank you, boy, he concluded, sending him a tired smile. He had no doubt that his goodwill would not weigh heavily in future events. But this young man pumped in him something that he thought having forgotten many years ago. Hope. Naruto sent him a bright smile. No problem. Believe me when I said it earlier. You did a first class job allying all the tribes together. It was my goal at first, but I did not have the time. Luckily you were here, Naruto congratulated him with a small smile. I thank you nonetheless. Have you any advice against the White Walkers? Naruto tilted his head to the side and frowned. Yes, one more thing. There is a guy leading the White Walkers. He looks a bit like the others but is in reality nothing like them. He has azure blue skin, horns on his head and pointed ears. He is not supposed to appear before some time yet but, we never know, huh? And if we see him? The dark-haired woman asked intrigued. Naruto turned around to leave the tent. Before exiting, he added. Run, asterisk neither a demon nor a god asterisk. You think we can trust him, Mance? Karsi asked once Naruto and the direwolf accompanying him had left the tent. The king eyed the dark-haired woman in thought. He seemed hesitant to answer. I'm not sure. He seems to know a lot more than us about those white walkers, and it's suspicious. But I'm nearly certain that he wants them dead at least as much as we do. We have a common enemy in this war. Tormund was the next one to raise his doubts. And what about what he said about people on the other side of the wall? Even if with some miracle he managed to gather them and make them aware of the White Walker's threat, they will never save us and let us cross the wall. We are sitting ducks here for the dead. Mance knew that the redhead was right, but he like the others did not have much choice on the matter. They could talk about it, but in the end, it would not change anything. We will have to wait I presume. For now, we do not have much other choice. This boy brought us a gift to fight against the White Walkers, and we will use it accordingly. If people beyond the wall open the gates, we will pass. Otherwise, we will need to make a breach. We have some time to prepare ourselves, so let's not waste it. He stopped a second to look at each one of them. Inform a hundred men to come with me to collect the dragonglass. Tormund and Karsi, you're coming with me. Others will stay here and watch over the camp. Calendar of the Seven Kingdoms, Year 295. Westeros, the landing of King. Cersei was lying nervously in her bed. She took care of having all maids and servants leave before closing the room. The window was left wide open. Temperatures in those summer nights were still pleasant and there was a perfectly clear sky. The moon and stars were shining brightly in the darkness. It had been ten days since she called for Naruto. She did not know when he would come though. She just had called for him once before, and it had been when her son died. All the other times she saw him were when he was already in King's Landing and had been coming without warning. He stayed a few days in town, sometimes even a week, before leaving to some place she did not know about. He said several times having business in the north and a threat that kept him busy, but he never gave her any details. Despite her asking, he still kept many things hidden. Well, he wasn't the only one, she thought. Their relationship was particularly strange to say the least. She knew that he had feelings for her but she did not know if it was love yet. If not, it was at least powerful attachment. It still was not enough for her to have him stay by her side though. She was sure that it was related to his business in the north, but as he told her nothing, it was hard for her to guess. Because of those many secrets, she could not trust him entirely nor love him either. She was not even sure that it would be the case if he told her. However, she came to accept that, in absence of love, she still had feelings for him. Obviously, it made her want him by her side even more in order to increase her influence on the Iron Throne as the Queen. The small council had recently become more and more powerful with the King's absence who was busier in horse, getting drunk and going on some hunting trips. Having Naruto next to her would be a considerable asset and a huge support. Then there was the Marcella's problem that Naruto still did not know about. Which was by the way the reason for her call. At five years old, the girl was already strong-minded smart beyond her age and wholehearted. A lot like Naruto. If her sky blue eyes were not sufficient, this was proof enough. And of course, there was also the problem of Marcella's particularity. 
Hello sweetheart, a soft voice cut her in her thoughts. Why did you call? She turned around, noticing Naruto who just came from the window. Despite his engaging tone and slight smile, Cersei could notice his concern. It was not without reason. The last time she called for him, she lost her son. She sat up on her bed and invited him to join her. Naruto complied in silence. I'm fine. You don't have to worry. I just wanted to talk to you about, she paused, trying to find the correct word without success, something. She bitted her, not knowing how to broach the topic. She glanced at him before frowning, forgetting for now the subject she wished to discuss. There was something that always disturbed her but she never put her finger on it. However, now she knew, and she cursed herself for not noticing it sooner. You still look the same as the first day we met. Naruto did not even flinch. He knew that she would become aware of that fact someday. It was more surprising that she did not bring the topic sooner, considering how observing she was. They had known each other for twelve years now. I do. It has to do with my power, he simply confirmed. In a way, it was true. Of course, it was not the consequence of his Mokaton or healing skills, even if it was linked, but something far beyond. Even if he began to really enjoy spending time with Cersei, he was certainly not ready to tell her about such delicate topic. He already had trouble dealing with his immortality by himself, he was not going to share his particular condition with anyone apart from someone he could trust blindly. And Cersei was not in this category yet. Perhaps one day, but not now. The queen nodded uncertainly. After all, it made sense for someone whose power was to stimulate energy within living beings to be able to look younger than he really was. However, it raised another question. I never asked before, but how old are you? Naruto tightened uncomfortably. She was more persistent on the subject than usual. Unfortunately for her, he knew better than her that he was a terrible liar. I am not sure myself. My parents died the day I was born and I had to raise myself so I have no memory of my early years. I am at least ten years older than you, he informed. Again, all of his remarks were entirely true, if each of them were taken separately that is. He was not certain how old he was but the reason was because he stopped counting after 1000, not because he did not remember his childhood. No better lies than half-truths, he pondered. Naruto sighed while staring at Cersei who seemed to be in thoughts. He decided to change the subject for a less slippery one. So, you brought me in here for a reason, nay? Or did you just miss me so much you had to call? The tease did not even make Cersei arch an eyebrow. No, it's, I missed you but I didn't call you just for that, she whispered. She was delaying the topic and she could see that Naruto was not fooled. He did not speak though, and she was grateful for that. It made it easier to vocalize what she had in mind. I told you about Marcella, right? The immortal blonde shrugged. Your daughter? Yes, you did. What about her? Is she sick? No it's not that, she denied while lowering her sight. I never told you that she had sky blue eyes, right? It started slowly, Cersei kept speaking after the short silence that was Naruto's answer. When she went outside, gardens seemed abnormal. Plants and flowers looked more radiant, more alive. Then, it evolved. Now, she can make flowers grow like you from a seed with one look. Cersei took a glance at Naruto and was almost surprised to stare at an expressionless face. There was no anger, disappointment or sadness nor joy, mischievousness or shock just an empty face with blank blue eyes. I see, he simply commented, it was not a problem at first. Nobody was really paying attention to the nature around us the times I took Marcella outside. And even if they did, there was no indication that she was the one responsible. But then, she started eyeing at flowers, and she became able to grow them with a mere touch. I had to be extra vigilant to not spread the secret. For now, only Tommen saw her power but he was too young to understand it. But if this keeps going, the queen ended, concerned about Marcella's power and Naruto's reaction. She had no choice. She did not know how to react toward Marcella's power. She was forced to contact Naruto and ask for his help. The well-being of her child was far more important than everything else. However, she could not hide the growing anxiety spreading on her face. Marcella, she is five, right? The wood user wondered aloud. Yes. She is lovely and very caring. A lot like you in fact, Cersei complimented. Naruto let out a tired sigh. The girl had been hidden from him for a little more than five years then. He hated to admit it, but in a way, it had been a good thing. Even if he knew, he could not have looked after her much, no matter how hard he thought about it. 
He had been far too busy with the North. It was a surprise that she had inherited of the Mokaton though, or at least a version of it. Can I see her? He asked, his voice still void of emotion. She's asleep now. Tomorrow if you wish so, thank you, Naruto spoke softly. You're not mad? Cersei demanded. She could not conceal the hint of surprise in her tone. I can imagine the reason you decided to hide her from me. Honestly, I couldn't have been here with her a lot even if I knew. But don't misunderstand. I'm not really happy you hide something like that from me. I know you have a lot of things on your mind you don't tell me about, and I don't blame you. However, this is something hard to take. He paused to think a bit. It was hard, yes. Especially considering Cersei told him only because she did not have another choice. It was a huge step backward in the trust he was giving her. Not something set in stone though. Then, something else came to his mind. What about your youngest son, Tommen? He half said half asked. Cersei tensed. This subject was another touchy one. She hesitated five seconds before deciding to not tell him about Jamie. Her relationship with her twin brother was not something she wished to broadcast. It was even truer with Naruto. She appreciated Naruto, she really did. But he was rarely present. She craved for comfort when her husband kept humiliating her with more and more whores. She often managed to silent the feeling. Not always though, and Jamie was here in those moments of weakness. He was understanding and wanted only the best for her. No, I can't be 100% sure, but he has emerald eyes and no power that I know of. She glanced at him and was not surprised to see him with brow furrowed. Cersei remained silent during a full minute before she spoke again. What do you intend to do about Marcella? I will see her tomorrow. Call me when you two are alone in your room. If she has a similar power to mine, I will have to train her a little bit. She needs at least some tips in order for her to not use her control over plants unconsciously at random time. He then let out a tired sigh, regretful about what he was going to add in the conversation. I won't tell her she's my daughter. I still have business in the north and I can't allow staying here for too long. It's better for now if she doesn't know. I will come and see her as much as possible, but no promise. If she's as smart as you told me, she will have some doubts though. Cersei flinched but did not say anything. She was in no position to talk after all. She finally nodded. All along, Naruto did not even spare a glance in her direction. Neither a demon nor a god asterisk, are you the healer? I am, Naruto confirmed. Your servant told me I could find you here. She said your daughter was affected by the grayscale syndrome. Stannis Baratheon observed him with distrust, anxiety and a slight flash of hope in the eyes. It was not the first healer who tried to treat his daughter, or at least slow down the disease. Until then, none succeeded. They made many promises but only facts mattered. And promises did not help saving his daughter until now. In the end, it was only logical for the king's brother to not be full of joy and hope. Not yet, at least. Naruto did not mind. He knew how tough and lethal the grayscale's disease was. Come with me, Stannis whispered before turning around, slowly walking inside the house. Naruto nodded and followed closely. The door behind him was then quickly closed by a maid. He received minutes after leaving Cersei a request to heal the daughter of Stannis Baratheon. A servant had heard of his presence in King's Landing and how he helped treating citizens the last time he came. Apparently, the king's brother was desperate enough to ask him to come in spite of his more than shady reputation. He did not decline. Along the way, Stannis eyed critically at the young looking man. He was probably no older than twenty at most, he guessed. It was the first time someone so young came to try to help Shireen. All previous healers had wrinkles all over their faces and carried with them tons of medicine, herbs and potions. This one did not even seem to have any belongings other than the clothes he was wearing. Well, it was not like the others succeeded in their task treating Shireen, he criticized. Maybe that oddity boded well. There she is, Stannis said while opening a door leading to a room with lights turned on. Into the room, Naruto immediately noticed two people. Two women, or rather a woman and a little girl. The middle-aged woman was sitting on a chair near the bed where the younger one was lying. Both were awake and turned their heads when they noticed the men walking into the bedroom. With one brief glance, Naruto noticed one guard next to the back door. He could probably come inside with only one shot from Stannis or the woman. He then looked at the two occupants in the room. Despite her age, he could notice a beautiful woman in the middle-aged lady. And considering that the young girl looked a lot like her with the grayscale symptoms on the left side of her face, 
it was safe to assume that they were Stannis' wife and daughter respectively. Father. The young one exclaimed cheerfully, confirming her identity as Shireen Baratheon to Naruto. Hello daughter. How are you today? I'm fine. Mother went to the library and brought me many books. In one of them, I read a story with dragons and how humans used to ride them many years ago. I'm glad you're doing okay, Stannis said with a very faint smile on his. Despite the disease, Shireen never stopped smiling in her life. Stannis could not give up in front of such a young and pure child. She was not his first one, he already had three other sons. Three stillborn boys, as a result, he would do everything in his power for Shireen to live. Did you read about how many colors a dragon could have? Naruto asked softly while approaching the bed where the girl was laying, attracting attention from all the people in the room. Yellow, green, black, red, blue, brown, white. When dragons were flying all together one behind the other, it used to look like a multicolored rainbow road drawn up in the sky. The blonde remembered those times. It was too bad stories became legends with time after dragons disappeared. But even legends could still captivate children's minds. He grinned seeing the expression of the one lying in bed, surprise written all over her face before being enlightened by a huge and pure smile. Really? Oh, it must be so wonderful to see something like that, Shireen expressed. It managed to get a soft hum from her mother and father alongside her. Shireen, Stannis called out. This man is another healer. I asked him to come and take a look at you. The six-year-old child put a cute puzzling expression before smiling at the blonde. The wood user replied with a tender smile of his own. He then approached the couple surrounding the bed and instructed them to stand back. Both father and wife stepped aside, leaving room for the blonde to operate but still keeping a wary eye at every action. The blonde took the chair next to the bed where the child's mother was previously sitting. My name is Naruto, sweetheart. I came to see what an adorable face you have under those scales on your cheeks. Saying that, the blonde moved forward to put his right hand on her left cheek, where the scales were apparent for all to watch. At the touch, Shireen immediately tried to retreat with wide frightened eyes. Naruto's left hand behind her head prevented the motion. A little further, both parents wore similar stupefied expression. And no, you can't touch me, Shireen begged weakly. Why you, you will be infected too. She nearly cried at the action. Since the grayscale illness started a couple of months back, she had not been touched by anyone directly, only through rags and sheets. She nearly forgot how it was to feel a small pat on her face. It felt good despite her skin set in stone, surely, but she did not want anyone to suffer because of her. Don't worry little one. Naruto spoke softly. Grayscale won't kill me. I just need to know how intense the disease is before treating it, and for that I need to know how infectious it is. Naruto then removed his hand and stared at it for several seconds. The assertion had relieved Shireen quite a bit and silenced her parents, but the ease was quickly washed away when they noticed the scales growing on the outstretched hand with an insane rate. A single scale appeared at first before it spread on the hand. In less than a minute, Naruto's full arm was covered with scales. He just had to stimulate the cells in his arm to accelerate the infection's progress. Mokotan gave him the ability to heal disease and wounds, and by extension, he could also stimulate cells, even contagious ones. It was also quite funny to see the other's shocked expression. MMH, interesting, Naruto simply commented, ignoring the stunned face of all people surrounding him. It was slightly under average in fact. He had met cases of grayscale disease far more intense than that. A competent doctor could have cured it within a year, or at least stopped its progression. You. Your hand, the middle-aged woman called out. Naruto did not even catch her name before coming. So much for courtesy, ah. As I said, no need to worry about that, he declared with a small smile on his. I can heal your daughter immediately if you want. The sentence served to silence the room in a blink. The blonde then moved his arm, closing his hand one finger after the other. All the members of House Baratheon could see with shock, disbelief and some relief the scales starting to fade away like absorbed under the skin. In ten seconds, when his hand was just a fist, all tracks of the grayscale disease were gone. W.H. What? The woman in the room could not help but said with a shaky voice. Her daughter and husband were not in better shape. I will heal your daughter, Naruto said with a tone leaving no room for argument. I request no payment. I have condition though. Firstly, you will not speak to anyone about what you are going to see. You can talk about the fact I healed your daughter, but not how I did it. 
Secondly, I won't answer any question. You can stay in the room and watch as much as you want, but I won't explain anything. He stared at Stannis who could only nod hesitantly. The blonde then turned to Shireen and spared her a bright smile before speaking again. And thirdly, once all scales are gone from your cheeks, I want to see your most beautiful smile. Can you do that for me, sweetheart? Shireen's mouth stayed agape for ten seconds. She did not really comprehend what all of those conditions were for, but she did understand that the man in front of her could help her. If he could, there was no doubt in her mind that she would send him her best smile. She nodded frankly. Tears could almost be spotted at the corner of her eyes. Okay sweetie. Close your eyes and imagine the brightest and biggest dragon you can, like the ones you read in your book, Naruto said. Shireen obeyed him without a thought. She then felt a hand cover the scales on her cheek. She ignored the hiccup of her parents. Tender, caring and gentle warmth rose slowly where the hand was before spreading on her face and then her entire body. Twenty seconds later, the feeling gradually vanished and soon, all that was left was the sensation of the hand on her cheek. But this time, she felt it entirely, as if the previous touch was but a mere contact in comparison. The reason was simple. There were no more scales between the hand and her skin. Naruto then let drop his hand. Shireen put her own on her cheek, confirming the absence of any scale or tough skin. The surface was pink and flawless. She sent him the brightest smile she could master, as promised. Thank you. She mastered to say between her contained sobs, Thank you, thank you. No need for that, sweetie, Naruto said while drying the tears on the corner of her eyes. We had a deal. I took care of my end of the bargain. You did the same. We're cool. The blonde was then turned around to face the woman who had the same face as her daughter. She hugged him briefly, thanks and blessing fusing out of her mouth. Stannis was more contained with his gratitude, just shaking firmly his hand. But knowing the stubborn and pragmatic man, it was huge. The House Baratheon is indebted to you, young man, stated Stannis with evident relief. I know you didn't ask for any payment, but if there is something we can do for you, you just need to ask. Naruto smiled and thanked him for the gesture but did not push any further. He bid his farewell and prepared to leave the family for some bonding time together. Shireen's mother, who he still did not know the name, was already hugging her daughter with all her might. It had been a long time since she had been able to just touch her. However, just before departing, Naruto turned around and took out a wooden bracelet from under his cloak. Just one more thing, sweetie, Naruto called out, briefly interrupting the family. This bracelet allows me to sense people when they are calling for me. If one day you need some help, keep it close to your hearth and think about me. As you saw, I can heal and treat almost everyone and everything. I make no promise, but I will at least come and try to help you. Is that all right with you? Shireen nodded strongly before taking the bracelet. Naruto just smiled at the girl who was back between her mother and father's embrace. The immortal finally left the house without interrupting the moment, just disappearing by the door from where he came. The family did not notice his departure before a couple of minutes. He was already gone by then. Neither a demon nor a god asterisk he walked calmly across the open window and glanced around the quiet room, eyes passing on Cersei before landing on her. The girl was just five and despite the blonde's sudden entrance, she looked more curious than surprised. He ignored what her mother told her or what she knew about him, but Cersei had had to warn her on one thing or two on his whereabouts. Naruto, Cersei greeted with a small smile. The blonde immortal replied with a nod before turning his head toward the little girl. Hello sweetheart. How are you? He simply asked. At the lake of response, he decided to further his inquiring. My name is Naruto. Your mother told me about your particular power. I think I can help you with that. Marcella, who was standing by her mother's side, poked her head at the remark. She had been told that she would meet a man who would help her in something, but she did not know what. She had been asked to keep this meeting a secret. Not even her brothers should know about that. How can you help me? She simply asked, clearly not trusting the blonde stranger. As far as she could tell, no one could help her with her gift. She always thought that she had been slightly different from both her brothers. It was beyond such evidence as they were boys and she was girl. The difference was more, primal, instinctive. Her brothers loved luxury and having servants doing whatever they needed. She was way more comfortable around gardens, plants and moist soil than she had ever been anywhere else. She did not despise people, far from it, but she was always more at ease surrounded by nothing more than nature. She did not know how to explain it clearly. 
It was just her instinct speaking, her heart beating with might. Her power over nature was probably part of the explanation. It was a part of her, something deep inside her genome. Was it her power that pushed her to reach for nature? Or the need for nature that caused her to have that power? In the end, it did not really matter. Her power made her feel complete, plenty alive. It was tremendous. Sometimes, she wondered. How were others doing without the same power to feel so full? She quickly understood why her mother wanted to keep it hidden though. She did not know if it was related with her power, but she always had a very sharp mind. Something akin to an eidetic memory, her mother said. Despite being five years old, important and serious topics in this world were not totally foreign to her. She was in fact more mature by a couple of years than what her appearance suggested. The day her mother was witness of her capacity, she was barely three years old. She went playing in the garden with Tommen, both children carefully watched over by their mother. Joffrey did not bother hanging out with his siblings despite her mother's insistence and the king was way too busy to care about his own children. Servants did not accompany them that day, Cersei wanting only her and her kids for some family time. It was then that she had found a seed in the grass before grabbing it for careful inspection. Tommen was too young to remember at the time, being only two. But Marcella certainly did not forget the look her mother gave her. It was etched in her mind. Her mother's face had turned into a complex melding of shock, fear, love and even a hint of joy. She also noticed something else in the emerald eyes that she knew was not supposed to be there. Understanding. As if her mother already knew she could do it, or at least, as if she suspected something on the matter. When the blonde newcomer took a seed in his hand before accomplishing the same feat she had done many time behind closed doors, she understood why. She could not hide her shock or her wonder at the sight of the full-grown flower though. I will help you control your gift, Marcella. I have lots of experience and I'm sure you will do well. Marcella could just nod weakly in silence. Naruto smiled softly at her before speaking again. First of all, I would like to see your power in action. I already know you can make seed grow in seconds like I did. However, your mother told me you only tried with flowers, is that right? She nodded. Naruto grabbed something under his coat and pulled out a small brown sphere. This is a yellow peach stone. Growing flowers is easy because there is only the stem and petals. There is nothing really tough in the structure. But growing a tree with wood, something solid and unmovable under the touch, is another thing. I will help you control your powers but for that, I need to know their limits. Your first task is to make this stone grow into a little tree, understood sweetheart? Marcella nodded silently and took the peach stone the blonde man was holding out. She stared at it, trying to find something abnormal without much success. She then turned back at the blonde man, a list full of question on the tip of her tongue. Who are you? How can you have the same power that I have? Can you do something else beside growing flowers and trees? It is by the way even possible to grow a tree? How do you know my mom? Why did I never hear of you before? How can you? Wow wow wow. Calm down little one. That is a lot of question, so give me the time to answer them one by one. He paused and let her breath. Marcella had been introduced with good manners and the proper etiquette belonging to someone of her rank. All of that had been quickly put underneath the carpet and forgotten with the surprise and the haste of the moment though. So, to answer your questions, Naruto thought quickly, listing each one of them in his head. In order, I am Naruto, as I already told you, I have obtained this power because of some circumstances and situation I was put into. I can do other things beside growing trees and flowers, but we will come to that once you know the basics. And yes, it is possible to grow a tree, I have done it many times. I met your mom twelve years ago during the rebellion in a dungeon as she was detained behind bars. And finally, you don't know about me because I am rarely in King's Landing, I just visit sometimes. This week is one of these times. Marcella put a sad and teary face. Even if most of the answers were elusive and still kept lots of mysteries, she could deal with it. Only one particular thing tilted in her mind. You will leave? But you have to teach me. Please. You must know as I do how fantastic it is to make plants grow, she begged. Naruto stood back uncomfortably and turned toward Cersei for some support. The queen only eyed back at him with amusement and mischievousness. Naruto growled mentally, already knowing where all of this would lead eventually. He had been stabbed in the back by his lover and was the target of perhaps the most powerful technique in all existence, the puppy eyes no jutsu. He was always weak in front of children which did not help at all. Unfortunately, no matter what face Marcella could make, 
he had more important priorities at present. He sighed and steeled himself. I'm sorry, sweetheart, but I have lots of things ongoing away from Kine's Landing. Believe me when I say I would love to stay here. Sadly, I can't. I will help you with your power and give you some tips to work on when I'm gone though. She agreed weakly with a soft eye, still saddened by the denial. Internally, although being sorry, Naruto was pretty glad she did not try to order him staying. It would not have work of course, but it warmed his hearth knowing his daughter did not try abusing the power she has as a princess. Well, if that's all, try growing this peach stone, Naruto told her, still on his knees in front of her. His small but warm smile served comforting Marcella who simply nodded. She had a weak and uncertain smile on her too. Naruto eyed at her a couple of minutes practicing on the peach stone without success before joining Cersei. He sat down next to her on the bed, both of them still gazing at the girl, their daughter. I already was rather sure of it before, but you're good with children, Cersei complimented him with a soft and pleased tone. If there was one quality she could have sought in a man, this one was probably on top of her list. It was one more step in her increasing strong feelings for the blonde. I only met her less than an hour ago, but I can already tell that Marcella has a caring and enthusiastic personality. She's a good kid. You did well rising her. Cersei took his hand and squeezed it gently to communicate her gratitude for the comment. She let it go when Marcella glanced at both of them. Your worry, Naruto stated matter of factly. You know Marcella is smart and will have doubts on our relationship. We can't prevent it though. He breathed tiredly and turned toward Cersei. His sky blue eyes dived into her emerald ones for an indefinite amount of time before he spoke again. If there is only one problem, if you are in some sort of danger, as small as it could be, if someone you don't trust suspects the truth, call me. If something like that happens, it would be like asking you to come for your execution. Cersei spoke with a quiet voice. I can't do that. Not to you. Naruto took her hand, not caring if Marcella was looking at them or not. Believe me, Cersei. If this happens, I would come and rescue both of you, you and Marcella. Even if it would mean confronting the Seven Kingdoms and the King himself. After all, he was already uncertain about putting an end to the Iron Thrones. This would only be the trigger for his choice. In front of him, Cersei could not hold his gaze anymore. She let her face down and her eyes shadowed by her hair. She was definitely falling for the blonde. How could she resist? She never stood a chance. Robert had been her husband. Jamie had been a comforting shoulder to lean on. But Naruto became her lover, someone she could think in a romantic way and loved deeply and purely. Neither a demon nor a god asterisk calendar of the Seven Kingdoms, Year 295. Westeros, Castly Rock. Storm Flakes growled, making Naruto side. She was never pleased when left behind. Of course, hanging out with people when a direwolf was nearby was not really practical in Naruto's book. It was the reason why she often stayed behind each time he visited a city or a village. Both of them had just traveled from King's Landing to Castly Rock. They were on their way to the north in order to cross the wall once again but decided to make a detour. Naruto had one business he wanted to deal with before that, something that he had forgotten each time he passed by the south. He figured this time would be as good as another one. I know you don't like to stay behind Flaky, another growl, but I will be quick, no more than a couple of hours, Naruto said whilst ignoring the glare the direwolf was sending him for the pet name. How about that? The place I need to go is a tavern. I will bring you back a chicken or something like that. Do we have a deal? She stared at him suspiciously before rolling her eyes. Naruto swore having seen her grimace but a direwolf's facial structure did not permit such a feat. Hum, he must have imagined that. Well, here I go. Wish me good luck furball. He departed before having to hear another sneer. He made his way toward a tavern he had heard about located on the border of Castly Rock. If his intel was right, which was usually the case, the man he was looking for should be here. He crossed some soldiers and farmers along the way but none of them cared to bother him. A couple of kid tried to steal his wallet though. He avoided them with ease. They immediately went away after that before the blonde could even think about chasing them. Not that he was attempting to anyway, he hold no grudge toward them. They were just kids trying to live on. He worried if they already spotted both fruits he put in their pocket. Hum, who knew? He finally came in front of the door of the tavern he was interested in. He pushed it aside and made his way in, glancing around for all that was to see. At least 40 people were in the tavern. Some whores were on the balcony on the first floor, 
staring at the guys who were for most drinking and eating. Several others whores were among them too on the ground floor. Customers were for most soldiers, at least ten of them, but he spotted others too. Staff members were serving them in turn, most of them women. And then, there was the person he was looking for on a couch. He was surrounding by a couple of ladies, prostitutes he guessed, and had a full lunch and a jug of wine on his table. He approached him and sat down on a chair across the table, attracting his attention. Naruto smiled at him before calling a young waitress who was just passing close, diverting his attention just one instant. Can I have a glass of milk with a piece of cake please? Oh, and can you additionally cook a chicken or something like that? It is to take away. She nodded with a grin and left the table. Naruto thanked her before going back to the person. The man was what people used to call in those old times a dwarf. Less pleasant ones preferred the word imp. Naruto did not really care. He appreciated people for their value inside first. You are Tyrion Lannister, right? I was looking forward meeting you. My name is Naruto. Tyrion gave him a skeptical look, then laughed. He took a sip of wine, then wrapped both of his arms around the waists of the women by his sides. I'll venture a guess. You were hoping to see the Lannister family's dwarf. Do I have this right? With a sour tone, Tyrion questioned. Naruto scowled a little, doubtful. All right, that's correct. Did I not just say that? How? You meant to make fun of you because of your upset verticality. He ultimately tilted after pausing. All right, don't worry about it. Hey, he would be a huge hypocrite if he said, I never judge people because they are different from others. If you're cool on the inside, then we're good. All I want to do is talk to you. It won't take long, I swear. Tyrion arched an eyebrow, his interest taking the place of his disbelief. All right, now that I have your focus. But hurry, I have some females waiting for me. A few minutes prior, the young waitress he had called interrupted Naruto as he was about to speak again, humming quietly. Here are your cake and milk, sir. I hope it's okay with you that I brought you a blackberry cake. Naruto spun around, a smile spreading across his face. Not at all. Thank you, he said, grabbing the meal, it smells delicious. With a slight flush on her face, she returned the smile. Thank you so much. I ordered you a turkey even though we didn't have any chicken. You can take it in the kitchen before you leave, is that acceptable? Yes, you really are amazing. Many thanks, and please keep the change. Giving her one gold coin, which was over twice the amount he had ordered, he congratulated her warmly. Then he turned back toward Tyrion, ignoring the red-faced young waitress, though it did cause the Lannister and the two women beside him to smile a little. I apologize for that, Naruto said to Tyrion. I would prefer to talk to you in a more private setting about what I have to say. Face to face, you know, without all those people. Tyrion reclined even more, leaning against the sofa. I'm sorry, dude. I would hate to be without those ladies, you see, and I am in more than pleasant company. That's correct, my love. He blatantly flirted. Naruto let out a weary sigh, starting to get a sense of the kind of person he was dealing with. I'm sorry in advance, but I have to be clear. I don't care when we get to talk if we don't right now. It won't take long, I swear. No, Tyrion replied, sounding a little more apprehensive. Would you please? As Tyrion got up from the couch, he let out a tune of irritation, and just as Naruto thought he would finally give in and move on, the dwarf shouted out loud. He said, I'm Tyrion Lannister, grabbing everyone's attention in the tavern. My friend here, he said, pointing his pointer at Naruto, has had a little too much to drink and feels tired. Whoever shows him the way out, I'll give him three gold coins. With a weary sigh, Naruto saw eight soldiers in light armor slowly making their way toward him. The blonde thought about walking out of the tavern on his own initiative, not wanting to cause trouble, but then he looked at Tyrion, who had a faint, contented smile on his face. It smelled strongly of magic, a dwarf from one of the great families in a time when the supernatural was just beginning to return to the planet. Are you certain there isn't a diplomatic solution to this? At last, the wood user requested with determination. Only if you just walk out of here peacefully, Tyrion said, brushing off the man is insignificant. I'm afraid those men won't fully agree though, he said, glancing at the eight approaching soldiers with a casual demeanor. They want their money and know a Lannister always pays his debts. With a tired groan, Naruto rolled his eyes and got up from his seat. With only Tyrion and the two women by his side able to hear him, he mumbled, well, not this time. Then, 
Raising his voice and turning to face the approaching soldiers, he said, I'm sorry for what's about to happen guys. When you wake up, your headache will be extremely bad. But it will pass quickly enough. Naruto simply took out a stick of wood from under his dark cloak and slapped it on their forehead, rendering both soldiers unconscious but still moving toward the ground. Before anyone could say anything else, two men were already falling to the ground. Using the confusion to his advantage, Naruto pulled out another stick. He sidestepped the six men still standing and struck the back of the necks of two of them, knocking them out cold before the first two men even made it to the ground, joining them with a tiny thump. Tyrion and everyone else in the area could only blink in shock, having seen the blonde move so briefly. When they finally realized what was happening, four men had already fallen to the ground, blacked out, but their muscles had not responded, only their brains, so by the time the four soldiers who were left reached for their swords, the blonde immortal had already reached them, spanning around and taking out two more men before they could pull their swords. All of the patrons in the tavern were watching with wide open eyes, and one of the two soldiers who were still standing gaped, ah, ah. When the final two soldiers did finally react, they were unable to stop the blonde who was only a blur. Naruto sidestepped one swing of a drowned sword and deflected the other, knocking another man before using his branch to disarm his final opponent and striking him in the forehead. There was total silence until Naruto turned to face Tyrion. Now that those little matters are resolved, I suppose we may search for a discreet location. I promise not to take up too much of your time. With a skeptical nod, Tyrion moved around the table to stand next to the blonde, brushing aside the two women who remained on the couch, staring at her with a mixture of disbelief, amazement, and fear. The dwarf was no soldier himself, but he was far from stranger to not recognize such talent. The dwarf had seen good swordsmen. He had beheld warrior, some among the best in the world, his brother was one of them after all. Nevertheless, never before had he contemplated such a technique and elegance in the art of battle. The blonde dude had plenty of it, really, who was he kidding? It was even more than that, amazing. It's a room upstairs for me. Let's go talk there, Tyrion proposed. The tall blonde was a complete stranger. He could be an enemy, a thug hired to kidnap him. He could have done it long before if that had been the case. He considered himself to be a fairly good judge of character, and he would lie if he denied not being full of apprehension at this very moment. Ultimately, the curiosity won out over the fear. Continuing to ignore the stare, they ascended to the first floor, where Tyrion made his way to one of the several doors on the wall, opening it and stepping inside while the blonde immortal trailed in behind. The room was small, lit by the window, with only two chairs and a large bed as furniture. A whore had been meant to wait for the Lannister but she had left the room when the mayhem had happened earlier. Naruto shut the door as Tyrion sat down on one of the chairs. The blonde declined the dwarf's offer to stay awake. So, what are you so eager to discuss? You mean Naruto, right? The blonde flashed a little smile. Let me start with a few random questions. Have you ever witnessed any supernatural acts in your life? Anything that seems out of the ordinary or inexplicable? An eyebrow was raised by the Lannister. You mean other than the fact that I'm a dwarf? Nope, nothing strange, he retorted in a mocking manner. Are you certain of that? It would mostly occur during a strong emotional time, when you experience extreme delight, anguish, or even rage. I'm rather certain I've never witnessed anything similar occur. And trust me, I have lived through my fair share of these moments. Deflated, Naruto realized that his intuition had once again led him to a dead end he had been ready to give the man a brief rundown on the supernatural topic. Well, it seems like I was mistaken back then. Claim that I was in the mess for nothing at all. It's a little disheartening. Tyrion gave him a disbelieving look. You mean, you made all that chaos for nothing in particular? Just a quick query? With an embarrassed shrug, Naruto said that he had not intended for the exchange to go this way. It was simply meant to be a brief check and inquiry before heading out. Apologies for the inconvenience. Holding out a wooden bracelet, he added, Well, as a payback, take this. Tyrion accepted it with skepticism, adding, If you need some help in something, call for me. I'll try my best to assist you, but I can't guarantee it. He hesitated for a moment, but just one favor, not any more. I have little time to squander. While it was partially true that he was offering the wooden ornament to the Lannister as payment, there was also the dwarf's condition which meant that there was still a chance that he might prove to be some valuable asset as a Lannister down the road. In addition, 
he quickly found out from talking to Cersei that her younger brother was hated by her lover, and not just because of his height, she held him responsible for her mother's death during childbirth, an event over which he had no control. Although he did appreciate Cersei, he harbored strong dislikes for that aspect of her. Hated by many for being a midget and by his own sister for having a mother who passed away while giving birth. He could feel the tiny man's pain. At last, Naruto advanced approaching the entrance. Well, it had taken less time than I had anticipated, as I had promised. I have a turkey to pick up and other things to take care of, so pardon me now. I'll see you. The blonde then turned to leave the room. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.